You're listening to the Visionary Lifestyle Podcast, the show that's dedicated to raising consciousness and empowering you to activate your highest potential. I'm your host, Magda Freedom Rod. Our guest today is Dr. Andrea Page. Andrea is a naturopathic doctor, an iridologist, a colon hydrotherapist, and a yoga teacher trainer. She is also dedicated to a life of cellular cleansing. Andrea is the former director of the detox program at Yoga Barn, the largest yoga studio in Asia, and she uses nutritional therapy, colon cleansing, and fasting as profound gateways to deeper healing. Andrea studied evolutionary anthropology and holds a master's of science in ethnobotany, a doctorate in naturopathy, and a certificate in plant-based nutrition with T. Colin Campbell at Cornell University. Andrea has a long list of certificates and trainings in her bio on her website, so check that out to get the full scope of all the wisdom she's carrying. It is vast. Andrea brings people to their own inner sense of aliveness through health, awakening, a sense of vitality, and consciousness. She's also here to raise the bar of what we consider in health to be the quote-unquote norm. I want to bring people back to the guru inside, she says. In her own words, she's here to empower people to take their health back into their own hands and learn to live with maximum vitality and to reconnect into our own inherent power, our birthright, either on the yoga mat or through fasting and wellness programs. She leads retreats worldwide and teaches 205-hour yoga teacher trainings, as well as giving frequent public lectures and workshops. I interviewed Andrea at the International Yoga Festival in India, where she was one of the speakers. We connected immediately, and she was my sole witness and lovingly held space for me for a hugely transformative moment during my trip to India, my dip in the river Ganga. I'll never forget that moment, really, and it was really special to have her there holding space for me. In the interview, Andrea goes deep on a lot of fascinating topics. She explains the power of fasting, the difference between a juice fast and a juice feast, and you'll get her surprising take on what it was like living in Bali, where she ran the deep talks program at the yoga barn. She explains why not milk. She shares her take on gluten and is passionate about empowering people to listen to the guru inside. You can hear lots of India in the background on this interview, and listening to it takes me back. Yogis and monkeys and Ganga, oh my. Andrea walks her talk, and just one look at her makes you want to listen to anything she has to share. She is the poster child for vitality, people. We had an absolute blast recording this interview, and I hope you'll be laughing right along with us. Make sure to check out the show notes at visionary-lifestyle.com forward slash podcast to find links to tools she mentions in the interview. And go to her website to learn more about her and her offerings and to take advantage of some of the great freebies she has there. Lots of useful info for you there, my rainbow warriors. Enjoy. Hola! <laughs> Andrea Page, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> Good times and giggles over here. Good times, giggles, gongas, and monkeys. Mm. Welcome to the podcast. Too bad they're not gorillas. <laughs> oh, too bad. Well, I'm kind of grateful that they're not. They're vicious little guys. Just for the alliteration. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're setting the stage for you guys now. We are sitting in a beautiful garden in the center of Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh. <laughs> Um, under a tree of monkeys and um, I was just recently in the last few minutes chased by some of these vicious little cute monkeys and um, you know I got a good up close uh, experience of the fight or flight response and this was definitely the flight response and Andrea was there with a stick not close enough unfortunately (laughs) but um, we are at the International Yoga Fest and um, Andrea is one of the speakers here and one of the teachers and I went to her class this morning and she has a lot of wisdom to share and um, thank you for joining me. Yeah, it's, it's so great to... An honor. Yeah, thank you. It's great to have you here. I know you have a lot of wisdom that people can really utilize and benefit from. So um, I've already introduced you. Yes. And so people have an idea of who you are and what you do. But we're going to dive a bit deeper. 
um, iridology. Can we? Can you give us the nutshell of what that is? Yeah, totally. So it's one of one of my clinical trainings. Uh, I did go to an advanced level, and yet, though I don't use it so much in my practice, uh, iridology, in effect, is the study of the iris of the eye to look at tissue integrity throughout the body. And so our tissues are everything. They're everything from, of course, like you might know, certain kinds of connective tissues like fascia, other kinds of connective tissues like fat. Or even, I mean, obviously your skin is a kind of tissue, as well as your bones. And so all of these tissues are uh, telling you the, the inherent strength of your body, how integral or integrous they are. And um, the other thing that iridology shows us is kind of like live brain feed. Really, the iris of the eye, the colored part of the eye, is made up of nerve endings that extend from the brain. And so as something changes in the body, the nerve connection to the tissue will indicate to the brain and that'll show up in the eye. And so for example, if you were to break your arm right now, that won't happen, Jaganesha, right. I would see it happen in the eye. Wow. And so it's direct feedback for what's going on in the body. Immediately you uh, would see yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the thing Incredible. is though that I don't, I don't use it so much in my practice because when I look in someone's eye, I see a thousand and one things that mm -hmm. could be improved mm -hmm. upon in terms of tissue integrity because that's a, a human living in the modern world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, f I find so many other ways to work with people which are much more on a level of we could say empowerment mm -hmm. uh, bringing them back to to a level of, of reset I love the word empowerment I love that you're about empowering people to be healthier and to take their health back into their own hands yes, right exactly empowering, that's yeah. what I'm all about I, it's 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 my thing it's my jam is empowerment <laughs> yeah. and you know I was just told I'm going through this whole rebranding process by this amazing um, this amazing female-focused rebranding expert, uh, Audacious Business, I think she's called, and she told me that I can't use the word empowerment, that it's been overused. <laughs> I'm like, empowerment can't be overused. It's not empowering if it's overused. Mm, <laughs> I don't know about that. I, I use that word too. We came up with impotent, hmm. but that kind of sounds like impotent. <laughs> It does. I want to rethink that one. <laughs> I don't know. I love empowerment. I, yeah. I mean, I, a lot of people are using it, but it's not. Mm, I don't know. Maybe it's a hard re one. Maybe rethink on yeah, that right? one. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's also it's not, it's not great for my business model. I could say because my, my true desire is that someone comes to me for I don't know maybe one or two or three lectures, four things, leaves and has a bunch of experimental ground. Maybe they'll come back for a retreat or a training, but I want them to leave and not have to rely on me at all. And that's very different than your mainstream naturopath, mm -hmm. where it's all about assuming the role of the doctor and uh, having mm -hmm. a hierarchical relationship where there are needs. Right. I, I want to bring people back to the guru inside. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad that you said that. And that's, that's a question that's been coming up for me a lot here in India, is mm. the notion of a guru. and and. I'm not one to follow a guru and I see a lot of people who do and I, and I it, it brings up a question for me every time because aren't we our own best guru? Of course, of course. Yeah. And the, and the guru is inside and this is, I mean you have all the answers you could ever need. Right. I, I can't say this enough. Right. And so it's just about taking away the veils, mm -hmm. lifting the veils mm -hmm. until you can find them and so that's why I use fasting as really the backbone of everything I do in my perception of the world. I am a natural hygienist, mm -hmm. uh, which is the origin of naturopathy. It comes from even before that from India, nature cure. Mm. And it's, it's simplicity. It's going back to the elements. It's allowing the body to heal because the core tenet of this is that the body can and will heal itself. It just has to be allowed. So let's, let's dive into fasting a bit. Uh, can you give us, you know, a sort of a nutshell? I mean, we can expand a bit, <laughs> but I'm sure it's a huge topic you could speak on for days, right? But just, I mean, what is the essence of fasting? Like, what, what are the, the hard and fast rules or, or the nugget? Or um, what's yeah, the easy. most important for people to know about it? Well, um, that the human body can thrive and survive for 40 to 50 days on water alone, uh, even much longer on, on juice, freshly pressed juice. And yet, it's something that's not really a part of our culture. It's though woven into our DNA. We are meant to go through cycles of feast and famine, and feast and famine. And yet, 
we're feasting all the time and the famine never comes. Mm -hmm. And so allowing the balance of the yin and the yang or the han, the ta, and allowing that time for rejuvenation and restoration because that's precisely what happens when we stop taking in solid fibrous matter. Mm -hmm. The digestive system over a period of three days shuts down, turns off, and at that point, all of the energy that would normally go to digestion, which is up to 70% of all available energy, mm. then goes to heal and cleanse at a cellular level. Mm. Okay. So that's, that's what we're in for. So is three days what you generally recommend? So three days is when minimum? that process starts to happen, minimum, yes. Okay. And so for someone who's just practicing, uh, starting out a fasting practice, because it is a practice, it's a part of a life, it's not something that you do once, it's not something that you go and do once a year. It's something that's a tool, really the greatest tool perhaps in terms of health that you c could ever attain or polish or the sharpen. Greatest? The greatest. Wow. Yes, it is the that's fastest way to heal. So you bring people on retreats and you train them in this technique and then they can do it themselves? Yeah, yeah, that? you could say that. I like that. I like that, that my retreats are a training. <laughs> I mean, you, you hand them these tools. You train them 100%. in this tool, right? I, I want to give people as many tools as, they, as I can, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's a practice. Just like yoga is a practice, fasting is a practice. And it brings about as much respite, as much understanding uh, of, of the higher nature. Mm -hmm of our connection to source and okay and I would imagine that people would need some pretty clear guidance around this right because I mm -hmm. imagine that you can really do it the wrong way for and sure do some damage for sure I do lots of do your do it yourself fasting lectures things like that okay um, someone's psychology is the first thing that would damage them more than anything they would do physically um, the people that you're with if there's a fear-based Approach. So this gets into the epigenetics conversation, 100%. right? 100%. Uh, the fear-based approach of, mm, I'm not safe, I need something, that thought, I need something, or oh, poor me, we have this thought all the time, oh, it's five o'clock and I haven't eaten anything today, poor me. And that, that well, is a fear of, of malnourishment, right? Yeah, which is very, very, very funny because, again, we're meant to thrive and survive, or we, we do thrive and survive this human body 40 to 50 days on water alone. And so the concept of malnourishment is very misguided because right. your, your cells store nutrition. And trust me, baby, one meal ain't going to set you back. Right. But, but three days minimum. So how long do you go? I mean, what's me or or the people the, that I guide? The people through. that you guide. <laughs> you probably you're you're a little farther down the path yeah. than most. I'm thinking on this one. I, I do one week <laughs> fasting retreats. Uh, I do recommend that when people are just starting out. So this is what I was starting to say when people are starting out on their own, that they start comfortably. Fasting a fasting practice is like building a muscle, and so you just start with waking up and having water for breakfast. Mm. Get really comfortable with that mm -hmm. if you need to do it five, ten times, whatever. And then you wake up and you have water for breakfast. Maybe you have some green juice for lunch, right? You do that five, 10 times until you're comfortable. And then you go full 24 hours. And through this, the biggest thing is that people are self-empowered. They're returning to themselves and building a confidence. And really it's a, it's a belief, right? It's an, it's belief through experience. Mm. Because I can tell you that I fast regularly for 30, 40, 50 days. And you can hear me and just have your eyebrows raised like they did. Yeah. But to do it yourself That's impressive. and to experience how you feel deep into a fast, that's your greatest teacher. And so the conversation of bringing people back to their guru within, that that's why fasting is huge because I have so, I can't tell you, geez, the percentage of people it would probably be something like at least 30%, if not much higher. Uh, percentage of people on my retreats who get to day six and say, you know what, I really didn't think I could do it. Right? I get to day five or seven even, and they say, I feel better than I have in my entire life. Mm. I can't believe it. I haven't eaten in five days and I have so much energy. Wow. Right? And so, I mean, I, I give lectures when I'm on day 42 of a fast. I'll come into a room and be like, all right, you, you've probably never seen someone who hasn't eaten in 42 days. 
I'm that person. I just want you to study me. See if I'm looking like I'm malnourished. See if I seem like I'm tired, right? Just this that, kind that of thing. That was going to be my next question is when you're doing these extensive fasts, like what is your lifestyle like? I mean, are you, mm. are you laying low? Are you doing a daily yoga practice? Like what does it look like? So I mean, it's something that's evolved a lot over the years and it's, it depends mostly on what kind of fasting I'm doing. Um, as a natural hygienist, I am a water faster by tradition. However, there are very few places on the earth left where you can safely water fast because you need reliable, clean spring water. And you need a place that's not completely irradiated or filled with EMF radiation or Wi-Fi towers or cell phone. And that's really, really, really difficult mm. to find. And so when you can find that almost quasi off grid space, that's golden for water fasting. In the meantime, for example, I've just been living in Bali the past four years, and Bali is not a place for water fasting at all. The amount of chemical residue in through the rice fields as a product of the Green Revolution in the late 60s, 70s, where all the petrochemicals were dumped in, the water table's totally toxified. Mm, right? Moreover, shame. yeah, there's tons of pollution in Bali from trash. They, they have fogging, spraying of toxic chemicals in the air to kill mosquitoes. I know, I'm sorry I'm telling you this before you're going, yes. but people think <laughs> that they're, <laughs> they're landing in paradise. Mm, and it's toxic. So I did not water fast really in Bali. And for me, it's such a huge part of my life that I had to find some compromise. And so juice fasting, and rather more recently in the past year, juice feasting became a way to balance everything out. What's the difference between a juice fast so and a juice feast? A juice fast is when you'd have maybe two, three green juices, it's a limited amount of green juices. If you're also having herbal tea, sometimes on my retreats I'll give coconut water just mostly for people's mind and taste buds. And uh, it's, it's minimal. And so the, the amount of calorie intake is quite low still. And the inherent essence of fasting, again, allowing the digestive system to turn off no fiber at all and only fresh, naturally occurring juice. Uh, on a juice feast, you can have two to three liters of juice a day. And after a certain point deep into a fast, you might mix in like only fruit juice, if that's um, orange juice. Or I was just, for my last, for my January New Year's fast, uh, I did a three-week fast and I was in Mexico for a part of it and I could have maracuja juice, the uh, passion fruit juice, mm -hmm. right, which is such a, that's such a delicacy because for someone to sit there and juice all those little seeds is right. incredible. Right. I've never had it before. So for example, yeah. something like that where you're still taking in calories. Mm -hmm. And so when I was working my crazy busy life at the yoga barn, I could juice feast and still live this um, this high power, high intensity life because I was taking in calories. And so whereas on a water fast, there are definitely days where I'm in bed all day because I'm healing, mm. right? And it's such a deep, it's a much more profound cleansing than is a juice feast or a juice fast. When I'm okay. juice feasting, I'm still taking in calories and yet my digestive system turns off so there will still be an elevated level of healing. And then in terms of the exercise part, I have a personal practice of Ashtanga Yoga and I practice partway through the intermediate series. So that's anyone who knows anything about that. That's it's like the equivalent of a triathlon in terms of sure. physiological undertaking uh, if you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I astounded myself hmm. right, on day three of my practice. Well, when I was fasting on day three of my fast, I was, I was at practice. I said, okay, I'm going to take it day by day and see what go, how, it, how it goes. Thankfully, I have a really close friend who's an Ashtanga teacher, and he was like, you're just going to have to figure it out for yourself. I'm not going to tell you it's unsafe or not to do it. And someone else was fasting, and they went up to my teacher at that time in Bali and uh, said, what do you think about fasting and, and Ashtanga? No, nothing to do with me. I'm laying there in Shavasana. Mm. And the teacher says it's, they're inherently incompatible practices. And Ooh. so, yeah, they're in my head. I'm like, okay, I'm on day three of a fast that could be up to two months. And he's just told, like, I, he doesn't support me. And so I didn't tell my teacher, which led me again back deeper to the guru within. Right. But I ended up 
powering through. Incredible. I made tremendous progress in the practice, in, in really so many aspects of my life because of the fasting. And so it gave me more power, it gave me less inflammation in the body, more ability to create space and open up in every way. Incredible. Wonder Woman. That's what I'm going to start calling you now. <laughs> Wonder Woman. That's, yeah. I need the boob cup thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also, well, let's talk about water for a minute. In fact, let's take a water break right now. Let's Love drink it. some water. Love it. Three liters per day, baby. That, that's my question about water. Hold on. I'm going to take mm -hmm. a sip of water. You pee a lot? Is that your... <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's going to happen for sure. But... Um, I've always understood that the amount of water that anyone should drink in a day is you take your weight, you cut it in half, and that many ounces is the proper amount of oh, water. This so is why so is it American system? I don't know what. <laughs> so why is it three liters, whether you weigh 85 pounds or 300 pounds? It's, it's definitely an average. So for a child, okay. it's going to be less. Uh, for someone who's overweight, I wouldn't say it's necessarily going to be more. But if you think about that, there's so much more to wash out there. Mm -hmm. So in essence, it could be more. So, but the average person, three liters? I mean? mean, I wouldn't calculate. I was having a conversation with someone earlier. We tend to think about what's in the body and then think about what we can add. I think about what we're putting in the body and see what that's taking away from the body. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a quick example of that would be like calcium deficiency. Mm -hmm people think you need or bone density to, mm -hmm. lack of bone density people fear think, of osteoporosis yeah you need to take milk you need to take calcium pills all of this whereas all of that is actually acidic and going to leach further calcium from the bones and so it's not that there's deficiency it's not actually that you have porous bones it's that your lifestyle is so acidic that it's actively leaching calcium from the bones to realkalize the bloodstream to keep you alive. And right. so again, it's not about needing to take something in or thinking that you're just inherently deficient. Mm -hmm. It's lifestyle based. Right, so solutions, to just, I, I love this topic because this is something that I do understand and teach about as well, about mm. specifically about dairy. And I'm kind of surprised that, that India takes in so much dairy. You know, they're all about vegetarianism, but not veganism. And I'm, I'm concerned for their health <laughs> because of this. Um, but then again, it, there's this conflict because Ayurveda is 5,000 years old and Ayurveda is all about milk. So it, that's a point of confusion for me. Yeah. And they're also pushing a lot of ghee, right? So that's a point of confusion for me. Do you yeah. have any insight I, on yeah. that? Yeah, after 10 years in India, I hope to provide some kind of clarity. Uh, I have sat with and interviewed more than 100 Ayurvedic doctors to try to find, and I've done a little bit of textual research in the Vedas and other books to understand really what's going on because I'm also in, in the evolutionary anthropology um, and my master's was in ethnobotany and my specialty is gastroethnobotany, the relationship between people and, and food plants specifically. And so, whereas milk is not <laughs> a right. food plant, the whole idea of people and food and the context of that over time is um, essentially what I did my, my master's thesis research on. And so in the Indic context, Right. We look at the fact that Ayurveda and the modern Ayurveda dietary advice has been greatly, let's say, updated or altered to the modern Indian diet. And so in terms of cows and things like this, because when you look at the Vedas, the Vedas say that freshly fallen fruit is the purest yogic food. Mm -hmm. they, they, hello. Right. <laughs> and so it's clear. And, the, and they worship the cow, and they take the milk from the cow. So how do we how do we reconcile it? I mean, well, where so the whole worshiping of the cow thing is one thing, and then assuming that oh look at this baby cow, you know, mm -hmm. sucking from from the mother's milk. I think that within the past more like two thousand years, or even one thousand years, that this became more in vain, because it's not historical that humans were drinking cow's milk, even in Northern Europe. It's not a practice that's more than a thousand years old, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And so when we come into the Indian context, I don't think it's something that was there five, six thousand years ago. I think it's something that was new and something that people, mm, let's say, ha have defended TNT mm -hmm. because, of course, milk has in it uh, these feel-good chemicals that boost the amount of dopamine, serotonin release. Uh, it's very high in calories mm -hmm. as well. and. Yeah. So what's what's the problem with milk? Why not milk? 
topics. I mean, <laughs> let's go just a little deeper into why not milk. Uh, well, my, my shtick on milk is uh, from when I used to teach kids English in Taiwan, so it's very animated. <laughs> oh, yay. Well, you're very animated, so why am I not surprised? <laughs> so, uh, milk, obviously, as we know, is made for baby cows. That's why it exists, okay? Baby cows. So unless you can imagine yourself under the cows that are... Right. Uh, there's just something where we have to question it. It's a point of entry for critical inquiry. Mm -hmm. And mind you, there was, I saw last year when I was in India, a poster of a human sucking from an udder. That's in India. It's, it Yay. could be normalized. But anyway, so that's number one. Uh, number two, cows have four stomachs. So just on a physiological anatomical level, something's really different because last time I checked, you only have one, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from there we see, okay, well, this cow's milk, it's meant to take a baby cow from this size, pretty small, to this size, pretty big, yeah. within a matter of six months' time. Mm -hmm. But from a health perspective, why not milk? So, well, we go on. Yeah. So when this substance comes into the body, right, it has an immediate effect of creating mucus in the throat. And you know this, we all inherently know this because you've been told not to have milk when you have a cold, mm -hmm. right? Don't have dairy products because it creates more mucus. Well, mucus is the body's defense shield. It's the body putting up a layer of armor saying, I don't want whatever you're putting in to touch my sensitive mucous membranes. And so that's a signal from the body. And so why not milk? Well, I, I, because it's not meant for us. Right? It's meant for baby cows. We have our own human breast milk, which we have for the first period of our lives. Well, which it's just a couple of years or a worldwide average of breastfeeding in humans is like three or four years. So, or even, I mean, even less, it's, but that's all it's needed for. And after that, it's not needed. Right, and so that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, and for here sure. we are drinking it into adulthood and I see people, you know, sitting, grown men sitting and drinking like a full glass of milk and it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me, right. but, but. So from a health standpoint, yeah. it's, it's just like, I, it's not, I, I could go and list all of the chemical reasons as to why milk doesn't get along well in the body but the first just points where we don't need to go further are it's not meant for human consumption mm -hmm. it's meant for the consumption of baby cows mm -hmm. number one number two right the human body doesn't like it it rejects it and that show, that's, that's shown why everybody's lactose intolerant exactly yeah. so when we see some kind of intolerance like this including celiac disease and gluten when we see any kind of intolerance we are one human species we are way, 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 way more alike than we've ever been different. Mm. And so when one part of the species has reaction, that's a message to the rest of us. And the thing is, most people have been fed milk for so long that their body stops reacting. We call this uh, a, a chronic case. Yeah, mm. uh, where we've beaten the body down enough times. I have a, a quick anecdote if there's time sure. for about milk uh, from a friend of mine who's an expat and she used to live in Saudi Arabia and she had her whole family there and it was her little son's birthday and for his birthday she thought she would invite the whole class from the international school over. Good old American mother, what does she serve? Cake and milk? or Cake and ice cream. Cake and ice cream. Cake okay. and ice cream. Yeah. So there they are, those little kids gobbling up the cake and ice cream mm -hmm. and about half the class was Saudi and then half the class was international Canadian French from wherever mm -hmm. and like clockwork about 20 minutes later there they are all the Saudi kids in the bathroom vomiting oh, <laughs> oh. Wow. why oh. because you take a human body that hasn't been exposed to this I'll call it a toxin because anything that's not meant in the human body is a toxin and you serve it, right? that young, sensitive, smart human body knows what it wants and what it doesn't want and rejects it. Mm -hmm. And so it's just that clear. I mean, an, another example is from cow's milk, uh, from camel's milk, not even cow's milk. But um, I go to Dubai every year. And last year when I was there, we were with uh, a friend of mine who grew up as a, a camel herder in the desert. And now he works for the prince's horse racing team so he's had quite quite an upscale in life yeah. but uh, he had camel's milk in his car and was drinking it and my friend wanted to try it and she reached out for it and he said no 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 no, no. you can't you can't you can't the first three times that you have it you're gonna shit your pants like crazy wow 
Uh, okay, hello, is that not a signal? Yeah. Is that and, but not a signal? then your body symbol? acclimates to it and you keep drinking it because... <laughs> and, and it's, not, it's yeah. not even that the body acclimates to it, it's just that when you hit a punching bag so many times, right, or you hit a person so many times, they're going to stop hitting back. Mm. Well, that's exactly what people are doing. And meanwhile, you're damaging body your body, yeah. right? Yeah. So th this is one of the, the things that I, I really like to the point that I drive, like to drive home to people about dairy is what you mentioned a little earlier about um, how it acidifies the body, right? And it creates this environment where it makes our blood acidic, and then our body compensates by taking the calcium from our bones, right, to alkalize the blood. Is mm -hmm. that accurate? Yes. Yeah. So we see studies of environments or cultures where there is more dairy consumption and more osteoporosis, and in the cultures where there's less dairy consumption, there's less osteoporosis, 100%. right? One hundred percent. So I, I like to tell my yoga students when I'm teaching yoga that um, weight-bearing exercise in yoga is your protection against osteoporosis and your leafy greens and tahini. Are we in agreement on this? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily encourage the eating of tahini just because any kind of concentrated fat I don't encourage the well, eating let's, of. Let's talk about fat then, because this, <laughs> this is a... But the other one the okay. other one I would put in there is sunshine. Okay. Sunshine. Oh, Vitamin yes. D, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Between the hours of 11 and 1, naked skin. Mm-hmm. Okay. Exposed skin. Yeah, well, let, let, let's dive into fat then. Let's, let, this is a, this is a Let's get fat <laughs> bottom girls. <laughs> this, is, this is a topic that comes up and, and, I, and I question and I wonder, you know, because, well, there's that and there's another question that might tie into this. Mm. Um, when I saw the um, evolutionary anthropology on your bio, I, I had a question if you were like a paleo advocate. Mm -mm. Okay, so because there's all the healthy fat you know, um, conversation in paleo that it's so important for us to have all the healthy fat. Well, I mean, paleo is just Atkins 10 years later when everyone's already forgotten about Atkins. It, it comes around every 10 years, all of these diets where it's no carbohydrates, lose a bunch of weight. I mean, paleo is, of course, better than Atkins, don't I mean, well, do paleo listeners listen to you? <laughs> well, hopefully. <laughs> all right. Because I, wa not, I want I'm them not. to understand you know, maybe I'm not, I'm not power putting, why to make a shift from I'm not that. putting them down at all because there's a lot that paleo brings to the world like naturalness, which is obviously also in the same vein of, of where we're going in more of a yogic diet, more of a whole foods diet, mm -hmm. uh, which is crucial. Eating fruits and vegetables is the dietary advice that I give to people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, the paleo movement's different, but the truth is that every, every 10 to 15 years, as a generation passes or goes through uh, the dietary in vogue scene comes along another diet where they eliminate carbohydrates and eat a lot of meat and eat a lot of concentrated protein mm -hmm. and people will lose a lot of weight fast they'll feel great all of this and a lot of that's having to do with with a lack of carbohydrates because many carbohydrates that people are eating aren't perhaps so easy on the system, things like gluten or white rice or whatever it is, any kind of processed food. And yet, this isn't how we're meant to be eating, really. When evolutionary anthropology, what I would draw from that is simply that the human system thrives on roughly about 80% or more of the calories coming from a carbohydrate source, which fruits and vegetables are carbohydrates, mm. and then 10% or less from both protein and fat. It, all together, yeah. oh, each, each, right? 80, 10, 10? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so you're advocating a maximum 10% fat and 10% protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, on, I'm on, around the 10% protein train too, but fat, I'm on a bit of a different train, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on fat. What What is a healthy source of fat? Um, why is more Spinach. than... Spinach. What? So the definition <laughs> of a whole food is that it has within it all three of the macronutrients, right? Fat, protein, and carbohydrates. The minute that we start to think, and this is, it's funny because people call me a nutritionist all the time and I'm like, whoa, I, first of all, I don't want to have anything really to do with nutritional science, second of all, I'm not a nutritionist. Mm. I mean, I, I have one certification in plant-based nutrition, but I'm not, a, I'm not a nutritionist. Nutritional science is so narrow-minded. 
Mm. Not only in the way where it isolates the macronutrients and looks at things in terms of this is a protein, right? Or this is a carbohydrate. When indeed cantaloupe, rock melon, has within it quite a high level of protein. Hmm. By calorie-nutrient ratio, almost as high as some of the concentrated proteins. Interesting. And so when we look at this, just people are so super, super, super misled. And when it comes to something like fat, it, fat is never something that we have to run for or catch up with. Because it's in everything, right? Just like protein is. And it's in fruits and vegetables at that perfectly prescribed roughly 80-10-10 ratio. Oh, okay. So where do you stand on things like avocados and nuts? Avocado is a fruit, a nut is the seed of a plant, which means that it's inherently indigestible. So no nuts and, in your and world. So the thing is why I, let me, I'll just, because I don't know if you know this about me in terms of um, my background and, and why I would say nutritional science is bullshit, essentially, Ooh. is because there's... We just went to the explicit realm with that one. Oh, oh yeah. sorry, do we not no, go no, explicit? That's okay. <laughs> that's okay with you, we're doing it. It's okay. Let's do it. I'm, I'm the boss of this show, so it's I love okay, it. we can do it. Very good. Uh, now we can go full stop, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you opened that door. All right, good. I'm glad we did. I feel much more comfortable now. <laughs> Uh, when we look at something that we're taking in, it's not only about a nutrition fact sheet because what soil was it grown in? What was the quality of the soil? That's going to determine the quality of the nutrition in the plant. What part of the tree did it grow on? If it was on the top part of the tree, it was exposed to more sun, which meant more phytonutrient release, which means more nutrition. If it grew on the bottom part of the tree, wah, wah, sorry, you're out of luck, even though those were in the same soil. From there, then it comes to the store. If it was a three-week journey, then immediately from when it was picked or cut, it's losing nutritional value. It might have sat on the supermarket shelf a few times. It might have been irradiated or put through, I don't know, a bunch of scanners and this and that. By the time it gets to your plate, right, what mood are you in when you're eating it? Are you stressed because you're not going to digest it as well? How much did you chew it? Right? Were you All laughing? Of these factors. Wow. You see, so that's just before it yeah. touches your lips. Then when it touches your lips, what's going on inside of you? What else is in your stomach at that time when you're eating it? How much water did you drink while you were eating? Because we're not meant to be drinking with food. It dilutes the stomach juices, water of break. course. Water Every break. time you say water, we have to drink right, water. Good. And I want all it's the listeners to do this too, because we're going to get people into the habit this of This is a drinking water. game, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> all right, and we can go somewhere with that. Anyway, so then, right, what happens in your stomach? And then from there, how about your own microbiome, your own bacterial balance? How much good bacteria, how much bad bacteria? What is the environment like? How rich is it? How, how many of your own digestive enzyme reserves do you have? Was that food cooked? X, Y, Z. There's so many questions that are part of the bigger picture. And so I got onto this tangent, love tangents. Yeah, because go. Wonder Woman. Because <laughs> of uh, my experience in colon hydrotherapy. I'm a colon hydrotherapist, and right. so I get to see what comes out the other end. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I haven't been practicing colonics. I don't do the dirty work anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I train people to do it, so I, I teach trainings. But it's, it's such an integral part of understanding the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Because if I see what's coming out, then that tells me so much about how things are or aren't working inside. And so all the time, I see undigested nuts and seeds pass through the tube. Uh, okay. Okay, go. so no nuts and seeds in your well, world. What about hemp seeds? Well, <laughs> you're so funny. Seriously, so hemp is doing, my favorite food. I need to know your perspective. Yeah, this is I important. was doing some intensive experimentation on hemp seeds. I was just visiting my brother in Colorado, and he's a big hemp fan. And I did find that they, they created some closure in my throat. So those weren't activated. The next thing I was going to say is that when you soak or sprout, nuts and seeds it mm -hmm. activates and starts the process of germination right uh, which makes them a little bit more like a baby plant it entirely changes the chemistry of the nut or seed itself and it makes it much more digestible mm -hmm. uh, so that is a half answer let's say and yet still if you sat there at a tree and tried to open every nut with your hands mm -hmm. you would not eat that half a bag full like you normally do yeah. Right. And so, so, so nuts, so nuts, even sprouted, nuts and seeds, even sprouted. You're saying they're better minimally. sprouted. Yeah. Oh, but, but minimally. Yeah. So we're we not going to sit bit. there. We yeah. can have a little bit. About a handful. We're not going to sit there and eat 10. I mean, right. I've, been, I've been blessed to be in the south of Italy, right, at my friend's almond 
uh, farm and use rocks to open the almonds and I think mm -hmm. it took me at least a half hour and I got through like eight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that gives you an idea of but of nature didn't really intend exactly. us to eat a whole lot of those exactly. that's your point okay okay yeah. so hemp I mean I feel like I said, hemp is my favorite food, oh, yeah. and I love hemp milk. And like you know, you put it in the blender, and you, but you're saying it closes your in your. What did you say exactly? Yeah, it creates some closure in my throat and some itchiness, which is it, it's, that's hmm. just a response from my body. So if you were to soak the hemp seeds, then likely the skin would come off, and uh, the germination. We're talking about shelled start. hemp seeds, right? Yeah. Hemp hearts, and so if you make it into a milk. Um, you know, you're putting it through a Vitamix, right? And you're mixing it with water. I mean, this is, this is beyond soaking. This is like blending and adding water. So does that make a difference for the digestibility of it? And the, the yes and no. It's still going to directly affect the blood chemistry. For example, all of these fasting cleansing programs where they have all these pre-bottled juices and then a nut milk, something like that, that's not fasting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's just not, it's not fasting because it, it immediately that fat, well, we're back to the word fat, right. goes into the bloodstream and, and changes the blood chemistry. Right? It creates more of a clog, we'll say, mm -hmm. to keep it simple, mm -hmm. where the sugars that you then take in, and sugars are from anything, from the green juice, um, from definitely any coconut water if you're drinking that p cannot pass through that blood barrier as easily to get to the cells mm -hmm. okay so are you a, an advocate for no oil at all well I mean now you're or do you recommend you passed you passed the bullshit door with me because I actually I don't <laughs> talk about these things with um, with my clientele because I I find that this conversation mm -hmm. is way too advanced Oh. There are so many things that we can do, like the foundations of health, that people aren't doing, mm -hmm. right? And yet they're having the conversation about should I eat oil or not eat oil? And so this is the this is the movement mm. in the modern health food world where people are oversaturated with tons of information. Right. They're diving in in the middle, and they don't have the foundations of health taken care of. Mm. And so we just so they're end not up hydrating chasing, enough. In the, in yeah, we end up chasing our tail. Oil. Exactly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so. I don't actually get into these conversations and I said a minute ago like fruits and eat more fruits and vegetables that's the dietary advice I give because if you can do that focus on that nourish harness that until you're eating mostly fruits and vegetables you'll be guided back to that answer inside mm -hmm. where it's okay when I eat oil I feel that the next day in my asana practice I'm tighter Mm. I feel more dehydrated, mm -hmm. right, et cetera. And then the answers are coming from inside. And that's what I want. I don't want to, I don't want to circulate more information or more of my mm -hmm. opinions mm -hmm. because yeah, my opinions are my opinions from my discoveries and my human body is, is pretty clean as a laboratory. And I, I don't like to talk any dietary stuff with anyone who doesn't have experience in fasting. Because again, in terms of the gradient mm -hmm. and knowing the signals from the human body, Right? The super polluted standard American diet to the gradient of, of 30 days into a fast. Like that shows me what the body's like at that reset level, mm -hmm. right? at that clean plateau, that, that cleansed laboratory. Mm -hmm. And in that, I can make experiments. But if someone's talking and has no experience with fasting, then they don't know what it's like to have a clean laboratory. And so the, right there, we have the caveat, the little issue of, all these people oversaturated with information sh saying their opinions and their thoughts speaking from someone else's knowledge mm -hmm. right which they read in a book or saw in a video not coming from their own wisdom which is a byproduct of their own experience so i i don't remember if it was this take or the last take where you started saying i'm young but i have wisdom to share and mm -hmm. it's like okay i can take that it's because i've committed to the experimentation and that experimentation, right, is, is what validates things. Mm -hmm. And where does Ayurveda fit into what you do? Does it fit in at all? I mean, when we look at, I, the, I'm drawn to <laughs> Ayurveda for, you know, the reason that it, 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 the approach is so specific, mm -hmm. right? Because there's the three doshas and then each person is unique and they have different imbalances, right? And, and as I understand it, all medicine is based on Ayurveda. 
Oh, that's a very Indian thing to say, madam. <laughs> um, right, so Ayurveda fits... Because I'm, well, the reason I'm asking this question is because when I ask about like fats and things, my Ayurvedic practitioner would respond to me with that, to that question with, for who? So as we make these blanket statements, fat, mm -hmm. no fat, you know, these, have these conversations, how much water, it's like this is, we're giving averages and blanket statements, but how much of your approach is specific to a person or do you think, I could even take it to this question about fasting to relate more to specifically what you're advocating, um, is that appropriate for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when you see evolu evolutionary anthropology, that means that I'm going back way in time. So we call Ayurveda an ancient science, right? Five, 6,000 years. The work I do in terms of studying the human system and our evolution is three, four million years old. Okay. Which is much, much older. And so when we look at that, in that time, the last two million years, the human digestive system has changed a tiny, teeny bit, almost none. In all those years? Yeah. Really? Because yeah. the first question that comes up for me when you say that is like, I, I think paleo. Anytime I see, you know, anthropology, I think paleo when we're ch talking about any kind of diet. It's or food, before right? Paleolithic era. Okay, but paleo, I, when I, my argument, one of my arguments for paleo is when I see that, I say, yeah, that was then, but this is now. So it's interesting, you know, because I say that doesn't necessarily apply now. But when you're saying that the digestive system has barely changed, mm -hmm. that brings it to be a lot more relevant. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, so that's one part of it. And uh, I do advocate, a, again, a species-specific diet. Mm -hmm. You don't see bears or gorillas or dogs going around saying, oh, no, my breed prefers this and yours does that. Like, we, mm -hmm. th that, that <laughs> whole thought process is crazy. Um, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. I'll say second thing is that the modern yoga take on Ayurveda is sweetly simplified um, that the science of Ayurveda is is much deeper mm -hmm. and a lot of Indian practitioners still live it and provide it but when they're in or engaging with a, a Westerner often it's it's vibrating on that superficial level but when we look at the word dosha and we get back in the Sanskrit dosha itself actually means in balance mm. dosha does not mean constitution and so the whole idea of, oh, you have this constitution, right? Of course, there's the prakriti, prakriti and the prakriti where it's this nature ver versus nurture kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. However, what we're looking at is that people are already sick. And so what I do admit, because people say, oh, well, how about metabolic typing and this and that? What I do admit is that people are at different states of degradation. Mm. People are coming in more sick than others. But that doesn't limit us in terms of how healthy we can be. And so rather than tailor my quote unquote medicine or my treatments or my prescription for people based on how sick they are, I guide them back to the guru inside. Mm -hmm. right? The fasting practice, the self healing, the body's ability to regenerate itself. Mm -hmm on a physiological level, right? And that in and of itself is what will guide them slowly along the ramp towards health. Okay, I, that's, you just brought up another question for me with that. Um, well, you know, kind of going back to the guru within and, um, and people getting to know their bodies and even the idea of listening to your body. I would love to get your take on on listening to your body because this you know these words are used a lot and I'll share with you first my take which is sometimes when people say like for example I need meat to ground me right or I'm craving meat so my body must need it I'm listening to my body like what's what's your take on that yeah I love it I love it You're because you know because on one side it's like listen to your body how does it respond well I ate the milk I feel sick right I ate the ice cream I feel sick I'm throwing up so I'm listening to my body and I'm not eating it but some you know. things are louder than others. Mm -hmm. um, when we get into the physiological responses, especially when it deals with neurochemistry, is when it gets really interesting. So, first of all, I'll just answer flat out and say people 
cannot listen to their body anymore because there are too many messages and too many signals going on at once and so they don't have they're not in touch and so that's that's what I do that's my job is being the translator a lot for the body signals hmm. until the person can listen on their own and hopefully during the same time in which they clean the laboratory or they clean the sounding board through a fasting practice where they have this new refined sensitivity. Right, because when you take everything away, it's like the elimination diet, like fully eliminating everything exactly. except spring water. Exactly. So when then when you start re-adding exactly. that's when you can really assess. Exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. Are we enjoying this prayer in the background? Do you hear this RT is going off? I think and you we hear have it louder than all me. the bells <laughs> going off just for people listening, just so you know, we are, you know, it is the RT uh, ceremony that's um, all about the Ganga River here, which is so beautiful, honoring the, this beautiful rushing river that I've fallen in love with on this trip. Mm. Um, that's the singing that's going on in the background and these bells is a call to prayer in the temple that we're just sitting near. So just more sounds of India for you. I just wanted to chime that in. I, I hear it very loud and clear yeah. in my headphones. <laughs> and just for everyone listening, if you could imagine this as something in your life, imagine if something in your life rung a bell every time the sun set and you had that moment to just take a breath and say, another day is coming to a close. Right? What Stop has happened and reflect today? and yeah. have, put some gratitude into that as well. That's what it's about. Um, let's, um, let's switch gears. Um, I'm just going into the four foundations of health because um, I was at your lecture this morning and we did this great little simple yoga practice um, that is that is that a tool that that is available for people to for you to share with people easily is there like a video on this or totally on my website I have a but it's just like it's a four part awesome to open the hips to sit longer in meditation. Um, and on my website, liveforvitality.com, at the bottom of the page is, uh, of the media page, is a gentle yoga video and right. soundtrack. So because if there. we're gonna start from there, because we're not gonna talk about fat because that's too advanced, we wanna get people to start at the foundation. Love it. Like you talked about this morning. So I wanna make sure that people have that tool. That's great yeah, that I that's already it. available on your website so easily. Mm. Okay. Um, what else? And the, I mean, my, my Foundations of Health lecture was what I did for TED. And so that's on the media page also. Oh, great. Uh, and okay. it's 18 minutes rather than an hour lecture. So. Oh, <laughs> lovely. OK, yeah. well, we'll link to that in the show notes. Cool. Thank you for letting me know that. Yeah. Um, in terms of empowering people to take health into their own hands, um, how, does, how does epigenetics tie into this? Mm. So I've dedicated myself to a life of cellular cleansing and waking up every day younger than I was the That's day why before. you look like you're 12. <laughs> <laughs> you should see me at the end of a really long fast. <laughs> you're looking like you're eight. It's getting scary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so epigenetics is the understanding that through our lifetime, it's actually our lifestyle which has more of an impact upon what DNA genes are expressed than the genes themselves. And so this is quite an exciting tenant because we've been slave to the, the slew of genetics that have come in since the 80s where we say, oh, everything's hereditary and this and that and it runs in your family and you're at risk. And we've really created this fear-based medical world um, that finally the science of epigenetics, thankfully to a lot of Bruce Lipton's work, has shown us that it's not our DNA that determines our future, but rather the lifestyle we lead that switches on or off our DNA. Now, one of my teachers, Dr. Colin T. Campbell, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes, I'm a big fan. Has also done a lot of work in this field. He doesn't call it epigenetics, but he's looking directly at the switching on and off of genes in relation to the development of disease, specifically the five most common maladies of our time, heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, cancer, and obesity. Right. And all of these are not only completely preventable through diet and lifestyle, of which the yogic diet and lifestyle is the prime example. Mm -hmm. In, I would say my opinion, obviously I have a huge bias there, but also in my science. Right? And not only possible, but 
preventable, right? Reversible. Mm -hmm. Your diet and lifestyle alone, right? Huge percentages, like pushing a hundred percent. I mean, in terms of prevention, right? Like ninety to ninety-five percent in most cases. Yeah, I mean, you could never measure prevention because it's like, well, if you prevented it, then you don't know who's going to have mm -hmm. developed it. There's no control study for mm -hmm. that. But in terms of reversal, that's where you really want to look. That the, the case studies for change in diet and lifestyle and mm -hmm. thankfully there are so many western mds who are hopping on this train now i mean dean ornish joel Furman, neil barnard uh caldwell esselstein along with dr campbell mm -hmm. uh, where we're waking up right. and saying oh wait that surgery or that pill isn't really helping you mm -hmm. and if you want to start to prevent disease then this is the way to go change your diet, change your lifestyle. And so and change your thoughts. Change right? your thoughts. Because Bruce is all about the thoughts, much more than diet and lifestyle. 100%, which is interesting because what happens if we bring it all in? Because still, even though those doctors that I just mentioned are some of my greatest teachers, they're still in this up to par level. What I'm really doing and what I'm interested or what I was born on this planet perhaps to do is to push the bar higher, hmm. raise the bar on health. Mm -hmm to understand maximized vitality. Right? How much more potential does this human experience hold? And so in that, when it comes to diet and lifestyle, of course our thoughts are a tremendous part of it. The more mindful we can get about all of it, the more in power and in control we are about dictating our future and captaining this ship sailing through life. Mm. And yet our diet, what's on the fork, three times a day normally for most people every day and what's in the glass how much water's flowing through our body how much we let the mother ganga flow through our veins <laughs> this mm -hmm. is what determines on a physical level how light we are or how able we are to respond and so this actually brings us back to the question that i think you asked and we didn't answer about if someone says i just need some meat to ground me that kind of idea mm. well that whole understanding about i need this or that to make me feel a certain way is very 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 misguided there is something to comfort food right? so for example a slice of pizza mm -hmm. if i could have a nickel for every person who walked into my office and said to me dr andrea i'll give up anything i'll do whatever you say i just won't give up cheese <laughs> don't right. take my cheese right? right and so we have to look at that and say well scientifically what's happening there on a neurochemical level that slice of pizza has almost a thousand calories depending upon if you're getting it in new york or chicago or la <laughs> mm -hmm. right <laughs> and that is like unlike anything we've ever seen in nature and so that th thousand calories that you can eat within two minutes i don't know mm -hmm. that's a straight dopamine shot to your brain it's the same thing that happens when you snort cocaine Wow. And so it's no wonder there's a slight food yeah. addiction going on it's with people. It's the casein, people. right? It's the, it's the casein? Yeah, I mean, the, the casein, the concentrated protein, mm -hmm. is a part of it, mm -hmm. right? Caseinates and the numbing effect that they have are a part of it. But mm -hmm. the dopamine shot comes almost inherently from the calories, mm -hmm. just that concentrated calories. Oh. And so that's why people love it. That's why you love ice cream or you love french fries or whatever it is. Huh. And so I never thought about it in terms of calories. I don't focus on calories so much, more like a focus on quality rather than quantity. Like I never think about calories. Well, then you must love your avocado chocolate mousse. <laughs> You see my point? Yeah, yeah. So when we look at this, it's just, it's so clear. Like what I hope to offer the world is the recircuiting system to hack your biophysiology. Where, whereby when you have the mindfulness, the yoga, the meditation over it all, mm -hmm. you have that much more power in determining its effect on you. And so back to the comment about meat grounds me or whatever it is, What's really happening there is that you're effectively getting less sharp, less potent, less able as you give the body either toxic food or food that's not meant for the human body, any kind of processed food, you literally get, I want to say stupider, but I'm not sure if that's fair. You're vibrating on a much lower frequency. Mm -hmm. So quantum mechanics could definitely get into that. Right. But you're less attuned to the overwhelmingness of existence hmm. and thus you feel more quote-unquote grounded mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
What, what do you tell people that are addicted to cheese? Can we give people a tool? Because this is a common thing. I hear it all the time too. And this is, the, this is a stumbling block for mm, so many the people. The first thing is they have to stop. So they have to want to stop, pardon me. No dietary change can or will ever occur if it's not coming from inside. The minute, I mean, people come to me and they beg me to write up a, this is a three day plan for what you should eat. I would never do that because I find it's the most in, disempowering hmm. thing that I could do. I mean, I shouldn't say I, should, I would never do that because if it was a chronic case or a critical case, I would perhaps help in that way. But to hand someone a dietary sheet or a recommendation, it's again, more of this information and not true deep rooted understanding. And that's mm -hmm. really what I go for. Mm -hmm. So for someone who's looking to get off cheese, <laughs> <laughs> if that's everybody who walks into your office says this, that. That. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'll give you the example that I give to my fasting retreat participants, and okay. this should hopefully help to understand. There has to be a cleansing period because for someone to feel the effect that some kind of food has upon their body, they have to know what it's like. Mm -hmm. And our bodies are like a graffitied wall. Mm -hmm. They are so clogged. There's so many messages. There's so many things going on from your past, really, nine to 15 meals. That's a great analogy. Yeah, go on. And so all of this is, it's like a nightmare. You can't see anything. So let's say I go up and I tag my, what should be my tag name for my graffiti artist career? Um, Om Wonder Woman? Monkey, monkey Girl? <laughs> monkey Girl? <laughs> WW Om. All right, so I tag my tag, whatever it is. And I say, hey, do you see I tagged the wall? And you're like, oh, I can't, where did, I can't, yeah, see, I can't it. see it. There's so much there. Yeah. So we got to clean the slate. So then we're going to go into a fasting week. Mm. So maybe you come to a retreat, you fast for a week with a group supported. What we're doing effectively is washing off the wall. Nice. Cleansing, right? Washing off the wall, getting rid of those past nine to 15 meals, hopefully even deeper cellular toxins, et cetera, et cetera. Afterwards, I'm going to go up, I'm going to write my same exact tag, WWOM. And we step back and you can, you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to see. Well, that WWOM is it's the meal or the mm. cheese mm -hmm. that you used to have before the cleansing that never had an effect on you. You could never tell because mm. there was so much there. Mm -hmm. And then after the fast, you have this renewed sense of sensitivity, which is your compass. Mm. Right, guiding you where to go. It's clear the effect I see. that it will have on you. So this is, yeah, does okay. that make sense? Yeah, okay. so that's, that's the way out of cheese. You gotta, start with the, you gotta start with the fast and maybe not on your own, right? Well, I cleansing, mean, yeah. I mean, cleansing. little by little, build muscle. I have a, a whole hour on can my... Can we ease people into it? Because I can imagine how overwhelming it might be to people listening right now. Like, I just want to give up cheese, but I have to like not eat food and just drink water for a week? Like, how oh, do, yeah. How do See, we baby I tend, step I people tend to go this? extreme. Um, <laughs> how do we baby step I mean, if you this? Well, I mean, if you want to give up cheese, then give up cheese. Daya in the United States makes a great cheese replacement. I wouldn't say great because there's lots of chemicals in it, but they're better than cheese. Let's right, just right. Say it's it a step way. in the right direction. One hundred percent. So go there and just imagine all the amazing things that you can do and get creative. That's what any kind of limited diet does is it expands you into a whole new world of experimentation and creativity mm -hmm. and food. Mm -hmm. uh, I highly recommend Cynthia Louise, Chef Cynthia Louise out of Australia. She's a mastermind at creativity in terms of limited diets. Uh, and she has a bunch of free classes and videos and things online. Terrific. Um, and there are so many other resources uh, to to help you get off cheese. I don't know if I'm the right person for that. No, that, that's a good start. <laughs> that's become a parent. But I, I really like the, I like the, <laughs> I like the graffiti wall analogy a lot. Like you've got to you've got to get you've got to clean the slate so that yeah. you can really understand um, how things are affecting you. And I know that like when I got off gluten I thought well I don't really have an issue with gluten until I didn't have it for 30 days and then I did have it and I was like "Ooh, my stomach feels like bloated mm -hmm. you know what can we just talk about gluten just for totally. a quickie and wrap this up with gluten? yeah if, if I could the so this I mean this is what I bring to the table as an ethnobotanist right the wheat plant 10,000 years ago in Egypt acorn wheat was very different than the modern commercial wheat that we see today. Mm -hmm. yeah? The main difference is that macronutrient ratio that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Whereas normally you'll see grains, the poaceae, the grass family, the seeds of the grass family, they'll have eight or nine percent 
protein. Mm -hmm. right? Gluten, which is the protein composite in wheat, right. in commercial wheat today, we see it almost at 90%. 10 nine, times. 90 is very different, nine times as much as 10. It's very different, right? And so we say, wow, well, that's really different. Well, the reason that it's been that way is because it's been hybridized over millennia, over generations, to okay. be those long amino acid chains. I mean, this is what made the boulangerie, right? Mm. We talked about France yeah. before. Yeah. That long, doughy chain. That could never happen with your gluten-free dough because it doesn't have those protein structures. Mm -hmm. And so we literally made this food, we created this food uh, along with us and also in the field. In commercial wheat today, the, the grain stays on the shaft. Mm -hmm. Whereas your ancient kind of grain blows off the shaft with the blow of wind. And so, so for farmers, mm -hmm. right, agriculture is agriculture comes into the question and food gets monetized and crop system mm -hmm. and all of this. Mm -hmm. right? How do we There's make it more profitable? Exactly. Right? So much more comes into it. And so the effect of commercial wheat, because it's that almost 90% protein, the body doesn't recognize it. It's what I call a Franken food. Mm -hmm. And so when that comes into the body, it creates inflammation inflammation or excess blood flow to the area is the body's defense healing response. So inflammation then is, is manifested all through the body. And the classic example I give that really rings home for most people is what I call the Santa Claus body. Mm -hmm. A man mm -hmm. standing there with his arms and legs, his face, they're all proportional. Mm -hmm. And then he's got this big old belly hanging over his belt. Mm -hmm. right? Well, what is that? What's in there? I wonder about that myself. <laughs> <laughs> if he ate a few children. <laughs> well, his intestines, his small and large intestine, right? All almost 30 feet, yeah, 10 meters of intestine. Mm -hmm. And we see that in that, with the inflammation of the excess blood flow to the area, that it's literally a swollen colon. So it's inflammation. It's, it's an inflammation, inflammed colon. yeah. Wow. Largely because of wheat. And that's funny because what do most men call it? The beer gut. Right. And what's beer made out yeah, of? Right. Wheat. There you, there you right. go. Things are starting to make sense. Totally. Well, that's that's great to have that insight. Thank you. Mm. What what about ancient grains? Because you know, what the, there is an understanding of this. You know, that's not the first time I've heard something similar to that. So what is, what about the ancient grains? You know, people are doing. I have friends that have an eco village in Arizona, and they're growing ancient grains on their property. I mean, what about that? Eat? Yeah, so I mean, it comes into a bigger question about carbohydrates, really, because uh, as I said before, we are meant to be thriving off of 80% or more of carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, and humans throughout all periods of time have figured out how we can survive on whatever carbohydrates we can. So that goes from anything from um, the cassava plant, right? A root vegetable which grows under the ground and is toxic. Mm -hmm. And so women used to stand in rivers for 14 hours, up to 14 hours at a time, with like the Ganga, and the water flushing mm -hmm. through to wash away the toxins, right? To process wow. these plants so they could be meant for human consumption, so they could be eaten for human consumption. Because mm -hmm. the truth is that we don't all live in the tropical fruit forest of the equator anymore, mm -hmm. like we did when we were evolving. Mm -hmm. And so unless we can return to that, like me, and just go live in the tropics, mm -hmm. We have to find a way to say, all right, well, how do I live in this truth of, of thriving off of carbohydrates? Well, some carbohydrates uh, are, I'd say, more graffiti to the body than the others. Mm -hmm. Of course, mm -hmm. we look at the fact that they are seeds. As I said, most of them are seeds of plants, like rice, right? like wheat. Now, a lot of the gluten-free grains that are coming out today, like uh, quinoa or amaranth, they're actually not part of the grass family. They're not grains. Right. This whole idea of grain is more of a cultural definition than it is botanical. Mm -hmm. right. But in the world of botany, they're the seeds of, of flowering plants. They're mm -hmm. flowers, right? The seeds of flowers. And so uh, that's why we would consider them gluten-free because it's a totally different class of, of plants that mm -hmm. we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of ancient grains, which was your question, yeah. I would want to see that they were definitely sprouted Mm -hmm. somehow germinated okay. and that takes us back to that co same conversation on nuts and seeds that mm -hmm. we had before okay so sprouted ancient grains in moderation sure <laughs> I don't want to get too specific right, I'm just, just I'm just speaking on behalf of digestibility understand. right okay yeah mm -hmm. 
Well, it's I'm like, also thinking about like someone's gonna start a company now called <laughs> Sprouted Ancient Grains. No, no, no. <laughs> By Andrea Page. But no, no. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to put together a picture or just kind of a mental checklist of what we can point people to to eat. Fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Must I say it again? <laughs> Keep it freaking simple so people can follow. <laughs> Shopping list. Fruits, vegetables. Step one, fill your cart. No quinoa? Step two, go to the cash register. <laughs> quinoa is something I've been doing lots of research on over my past eight years of journeys to Peru. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, the, the only thing I'll say about quinoa that most people don't know is that there is a layer of saponins around the seed, mm -hmm. which are soapy agents, which are very uh, right. un unfriendly to the human digestive That's system. That's why we rinse it really well before we cook so it. So it's not that it needs to be rinsed, it actually needs to be soaked for a minimum of six better 24 hours. Mm. And when that okay. happens, you'll notice the soak water gets really soapy. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah, quinoa, if not properly treated, it will come out in your poop undigested. And so anything coming out in your poop undigested is a message to your body that you're not meant to be eating it. And so mm. perhaps my closing message for the audience will be that when you get off of the toilet from your squatting position, which turn you didn't around. even get into yet, yeah, <laughs> turn on. around and look. Yeah. You want to see what's there. See what's still there. We're going to have to do another episode with you another time because we didn't get to poop. We didn't get to <laughs> squatting. We didn't get to the moss and There's a whole checklist. Yeah, we're going to have to do this again. Thank you so much for your time. You're so welcome. It's been so amazing spending time with you and learning from you and just being Likewise. around your amazing, youthful, vibrant, super vital <laughs> energy. And yeah, I'm so grateful for your wisdom and, you know, for the way that you're showing up in the world and how much you're showing, you know, you're showing up for people and showing people the way and, and just really improving health on the planet. And thank you for answering the call to do this work. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for being a witness. Mm. Yeah. And we get to share, you know, through this podcast, we get to share your wisdom with a lot more people. So thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the work you do. Namaste. Mm. Today's episode is brought to you by the Conscious Eating 101 e-course. This is a six-week online course aimed at empowering you to make food choices that are in alignment with your values. The program is based on Ahimsa, also known as non-harm, and helps you make every bite that you take an expression of love, self-love, animal love, and planet love. The course offers 15 lessons and 20 nutritious and delicious recipes and is offered over six weeks that you can do at your own pace. It includes lessons like plant-based nutrition, protein, dairy alternatives, the story on sugar, GMOs, label reading, and many more. If you're looking to increase your health and happiness, balance your weight, reduce your footprint on the planet, and align your food choices with your values, or are interested in being part of the solution to huge world problems like climate change, rainforest destruction, and world hunger, then this is the course for you. If this speaks to you, please check out ConsciousEating101.com today. Thanks so much for answering the call to be here today. I'm so glad you're part of our tribe of activated rainbow warriors. If you found the show in any way empowering or inspiring, I would be so grateful if you would share the show on social media or with friends and family that you think would benefit from these conversations. And also, rate and review the show in iTunes. This is really the very best way to help support the show and help us get noticed by others who are looking for the sort of content that we're sharing. Now notice there are no outside ads playing here. That's because the show is supported by you, the listener. You can become a patron of the show with a small monthly donation by checking out the perks on our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash visionary lifestyle and signing up there. There's also a one-time donation button on the podcast page of the website if that suits you better. And just so you know, your donations help to cover the necessary out-of-pocket monthly expenses to produce the show and will also help us grow so we can inspire and educate even more people. And hey tribe, I'd love to hear from you. Visit me at visionary-lifestyle.com and please tell me your comments and questions. 
I really look forward to connecting with you. I love you. Namaste.